Tonight, the rising tensions in America, now at the heart of the 2020 race. In Portland, new details on the Trump supporter killed there, while the candidates for president spar over who is to blame. Joe Biden back on the campaign trail with his strongest words yet. And our new series, a reality check on violence in American cities, what the statistics show. Hundreds of thousands desperate, still without power amid the destruction from Hurricane Laura. How long will they have to wait? The U.S. surpassing 6 million coronavirus cases, outbreaks exploding on college campuses, the COVID SWAT team being deployed to one university. The major change at the major airlines, getting rid of something most travelers can't stand. And caught on camera, a whale of a tail and the 10-year-old with a front row seat. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening. I'm Kristen Welker in for Lester. We begin tonight with the flashpoints in American cities, largely peaceful protests, but some marred by violence. Now all of it at the center of the 2020 presidential election. Joe Biden now accusing President Trump of encouraging the unrest and distracting from the COVID crisis. The president wasting no time firing back, trying to paint Biden as weak. It comes as President Trump is poised to visit Kenosha, Wisconsin, where some demonstrations have turned deadly. We have it all covered and begin with Gabe Gutierrez on the ground in Kenosha, and a warning, some of the video may be hard to watch. From Kenosha to Portland, tonight mounting tension. As President Trump prepares to visit Wisconsin following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. We need him here. We need strong leadership. A president visiting town obviously takes a lot of resources that could be put someplace else. In a letter to the president, Wisconsin's governor writes in part, I am concerned your presence will only hinder our healing. I think that Kenosha at this present time needs peace. Today, the White House said it reached out to Blake's family, but their attorney said so far he'd not been contacted. Over the weekend, peaceful protests here, even as the union representing Kenosha police took a stronger stance defending the officers involved. The union says the officers responded to a complaint that Blake was trying to steal the caller's keys and vehicle. They add Blake had a knife and was non-compliant when officers issued verbal commands and that he put one of the officers in a headlock. The police union is a union that support our police officers, in my opinion, no matter how unbelievable the excessive use of force, the brutal use of force used against black people in America. Across the country, Blake's shooting has inflamed racial tensions that have been simmering all summer. Over the weekend, clashes from Washington, D.C. and Tallahassee, Florida to Portland, where a man was shot and killed amid the unrest, although it's unknown if they were connected. Hours before, a caravan of the president's supporters faced off against counter-protesters in the city. The founder of the far-right group Patriot Player told NBC's Aaron McLaughlin the victim was a friend and did not provoke his attackers. The way that me is portraying it is that it had something to do with the, the Trump crews, but it didn't. He got attacked. So I don't know what else we could have done differently. And Gabe joins us now. Gabe, what, if any, role did the White House have in sending National Guard troops to Kenosha to keep the peace? Well, Kristen, despite the president's tweets, local officials here say that the increased presence of the National Guard was a state request and would not have been initiated by the White House. Kristen? Gabe. Gabe Gutierrez in Kenosha, where President Trump is set to visit tomorrow. Gabe, thank you. With so many claims being made about the increase in violence in urban areas, we want to make sure you have all the facts. Tonight, we're launching a new series, America's Cities, Fact versus Fiction. Just how much has the murder rate risen and why? Tom Costello now on what the numbers really show. It's happening in cities across the country. Violence numbers spiking again in the city over the weekend. Another weekend of shootings and bloodshed around New York City. Murder is on the rise. Kent City is not only having a violent weekend, but a violent year. In some places, up more than 50% over last year, up 105% in Milwaukee. Many of the victims rushed here to the Freydert Medical College of Wisconsin. Chief Trauma Surgeon Mark DeMoya says the past four months have been different. What have you seen inside the trauma room? A lot more gunshot wounds and a lot more stabbings, uh, a lot more lethal types of injuries. But in addition to that, we were also seeing a lot more domestic violence. Like many cities, Milwaukee's surge in violence has coincided with the pandemic. 
more people sitting on top of each other in underprivileged neighborhoods with many now unemployed. Nationwide, 69 cities have seen murders jump 20 percent or more. Houston and San Francisco up 33 percent. Atlanta up 46 percent. Minneapolis up 89 percent. There'll be a lot of just random gunshots going around this way. Just stay in touch with us. Okay, I will. Patrolling the streets of Milwaukee, the 414 Life Team trying to calm neighborhoods where violence has soared. City Prevention Director Reggie Moore says the pandemic has only added fuel to a desperate situation. So when we look at the neighborhoods that overlay in terms of that have high concentrations of homicides and non-fatal shootings and that have high incidences of COVID, we definitely see an overlap. Washington, D.C., also dealing with an increase in murder. It's very troubling to us. For the last three years, uh, we've had reductions in violent crime across our city. The Justice Department's Operation Legend is teaming up with local police in nine cities to crack down on violent crime. So far, 1,500 arrests. And we wouldn't have suspects in custody without our federal partnerships. But the people on the front lines fear the violence could worsen when the weather turns cold. You have uh, social isolation. You have the economic uh, devastation. You have just the stress of the disease itself. Uh, then you have those communities that are at the highest risk being affected by COVID, and you're going to see an explosion. Importantly, Operation Legend, not to be confused with that effort to send agents to protest zones around the country. And while homicides are up nationwide, the actual violent crime rate is down. And experts note the crime rate is still much lower than it was 30 years ago. Kristen? Tom Costello, thank you. There is a desperate struggle in the South tonight. So many still without power days after Hurricane Laura struck. And officials warning the generators some are using to keep the lights on may pose a deadly risk. Morgan Chesky is in Louisiana. Tonight, for tens of thousands, Hurricane Laura's impact could be long lasting. Early estimates have Laura leaving behind up to $20 billion in losses. Roof damage, part of the inside fell through, water in the house. Yeah, it's a mess. With roads finally starting to reopen, people are pouring into downtown Lake Charles, lining up by the thousands, all in hopes of getting much needed supplies. Louisiana National Guard working nonstop, handing out 700,000 meals, more than a million liters of water. So many still out of power. Now, turning to generators. The hurricane was rough enough, and this, this is devastated. Craig Evans dropped off gas for friends Rosalie and John Lewis to run their generator. It was inside their garage, the door open for ventilation. But the next day, he found that door had shut. Inside the home, the woman he loved like a mother and three others died. I go outside and come back in, and I see the fifth body. Is grieving. Miraculously, John Lewis survived. Now Evans and Lewis's son Lyle both praying he pulls through. Where do you go from here? I've been thinking about that. One thing I cannot do is look back. Mm -hmm. right. if, I, if I keep looking back, I'll never see what's in front of me. So I have to give it to God because my life, my life changed in the twinkling of an eye. And tonight we've learned of the 16 deaths connected to Laura. Half of those have been related to generators. An emergency alert going out warning everyone that when misused, they can be deadly. Kristen. Morgan Chesky, thank you. We are back in 60 seconds with coronavirus outbreaks exploding on campuses and the SWAT team in one state trying to stop it. We're back now with the race to contain COVID on campus and the drastic new measures some schools are now taking to keep students safe. Miguel Almaguer has all the details. From universities in California to college campuses in New York, tonight as coronavirus cases explode at institutions of higher learning, officials are canceling classes, locking down student housing, and even suspending part of the school year. Students will not be allowed to the, leave the campus. At SUNY Oneonta in New York, a COVID SWAT team is deploying rapid testing after more than 100 students caught the virus following a series of parties. On-campus learning now off limits for at least two weeks. It's a wake-up call for people of all ages. We all read the newspaper, watch television, hear about these parties that take place, and it spreads like wildfire. <laughs> 
With college parties fueling the spread of the virus, UNC Chapel Hill, TCU, and Alabama confirm hundreds of cases as Temple University also suspends classes for two weeks. But the virus comes at a higher cost than just education. Health officials hoping to curb community spread say infected students, mostly with mild symptoms, should not return home. Things aren't going to get better until we start taking it seriously. You got to realize the times that we're at right now and not have parties like there is there are so many parties like around my house on a nightly basis. As the virus spreads across the country at a slower rate, the nation has now surpassed 6 million COVID cases. California leading the U.S. with 700,000 cases. Because of that number, schools like USC have turned to all online learning, but students are still gathering off campus. And even after small gatherings, the virus is multiplying. Tonight, a lesson to be learned by the very students who should know better. Miguel Almaguer, NBC News, Los Angeles. The FDA chief is under fire tonight for saying he might fast track the approval of a coronavirus vaccine. The statement raising concerns the Trump administration is putting politics before public health. Jeff Bennett reports. The head of the Food and Drug Administration says he's prepared to fast track a coronavirus vaccine as quickly as possible if the benefits outweigh the risks. FDA chief Dr. Stephen Hahn telling the Financial Times a vaccine developer could receive federal approval before phase three trials are complete. We may find that appropriate. We may find that inappropriate. We will make a determination. Phase three trials are the most rigorous of all the clinical tests. Hahn insists he wouldn't rush the process just to please the president. This is not going to be a political decision, but it could be crucial to President Trump's re-election chances. We are delivering life-saving therapies and will produce a vaccine before the end of the year or maybe even sooner. Last week, the FDA granted emergency authorization of convalescent plasma, despite concerns among health officials about insufficient clinical data. At the press conference, Han overstated the therapy's benefits, later calling the criticism he received in return entirely justified. There's a pressure to have something done, and they're bending and they're moving ahead without having really excellent, excellent clinical trial data to support the idea that this is going to work. Leading to a lack of public trust. According to a new national survey, 78% of Americans worry the COVID-19 vaccine approval process is being driven more by politics than science. A lot of people are skeptical, and uh, especially in this context uh, where people are worried about cutting corners. A vaccine might be safe, it might be effective, but if people won't take it, it won't be able to achieve the goals. The view among leading public health experts is that a COVID-19 vaccine wouldn't be available to the general public until early 2021, well after the November election. Kristen? Jeff Bennett, thank you. We are back now with some good news for air travelers. Delta and American Airlines announcing they're dropping flight change fees for domestic and even some foreign destinations. The move follows a similar announcement yesterday by United. But there is a catch in some cases, like the no-frills basic economy fares. The fee may still apply. Well, another passing to note, legendary Georgetown men's basketball coach John Thompson has died. The Hall of Famer led the Hoyas to three Final Fours, including a national championship in 1984, the first black coach to do so. John Thompson was 78 years old. And when we come back, a whale of a tale, one girl's caught-on-camera moment and why it's making such a splash. Before we go tonight, the big adventure for a little girl and her unbelievable caught-on-camera moment. Here's Kevin Tibbles with her incredible story. Now here's a whale of a tale. Take a look. And take a closer look at 10-year-old Sarah Russell's reaction. Fishing with Dad Sean in Conception Bay off the coast of Newfoundland in Canada. Two humpback whales weighing about 45 tons each suddenly leapt skyward. It was crazy. At first, Sarah was scared. Who wouldn't be? Now, what do you think of that? But Dad was there to reassure her. We tried to stay our distance, but 
they're curious and they'll come in to check you out. Whales are plentiful here, but a whale ballet, that's a different story. Little is known as to why whales breach so spectacularly, but it is believed they're communicating with one another. Are you famous, Sarah, for telling fish tales? I catch the fish and Dad tells the fish tales. And they did catch some fish once they had time to catch their breath. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News. That is some boat ride and a priceless reaction. That is nightly news for this Monday. Thank you for watching. I'm Kristen Welker. Have a great night. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.